Our most, whoa. I thought you thought this was gonna work here. Are most of you trial court administrators? Any appellate people? Judge Higginbotham is uh, the, pre the current president of the American Judges Association. She's an appellate judge. And so I wanted to put some framework to what we're talking about, because I think that appellate judges think and act different than those of at, the, at the trial court level. And it's best illustrated by a story recently of a appellate court judge, Supreme Court justice, a law professor, and a trial court judge who went hunting in South Dakota. They were gonna go out for looking for pheasants. And so they were deferential to the Supreme Court justice, and they said, Justice, you can have the first shot. And so he came walking along, and a bird came flying out of the bush, and he aimed at the bush, at the bird, and then he said, you know, there's a four-part test to determine whether or not a bird is a pheasant, and he went out and identified the four-part test, and by the time he was done, that bird was long gone. So they told the law professor, you can go next. They walked along a little further, out came the uh, bird. He quickly announced the four-part test, but then he turned to the other two and he said, you know, we have to be concerned about the collateral consequences of the lead that is in my shot, because you'll notice that there's some water over there and the bird was long gone. So then they said to the trial court judge, um, you can get the next shot. They walked along a little bit further and there's a ruffling in the bush and he goes bang, 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 bang. And um, they looked at him and he said, God, I hope it was a bird. We do things pretty fast. It's very reflexive about what we do. And so what we're gonna try to talk to you about is a couple of basic principles. One is, how can we make the justice system more fair? And I'm convinced, because I've been involved in NACOM for a number of years, that the people in this room and the people in your organization are uniquely positioned to move the American state court system to be a lot more effective in a very troubling time. I think we have to be honest right now that there's a lot of people who are dissatisfied with the American justice system. The legitimacy of our decision making is being challenged in lots of different places. And what we'd like to try to convince you that is that you can leave this conference with some tools to go back to your court to make it even better than it is today. And then the second part we want to try to deal with is if we're going to be able to meet that first challenge, we also have to be much, much better at how we make decisions. And what we're going to try to convince you between now and 1145 is you could go back, become a better decision maker yourself, engage your staff in better decision making, and engage your judges in that effort as, to, as well. Leadership focuses on relationships, motivating and the ability to engage colleagues and employees around a shared vision. And the shared vision we would like to share with you, to convince you to join us in is, if we can make state courts more centrally focused on fairness, we're gonna end up making the justice system a lot better. I'll, I'll make one comment just to audience participation here is, uh, shared vision. Do you know what the difference between a vision and a hallucination is? Anybody? Come on, you guys are smart. You must know that. It's very simple. The difference between a vision and a hallucination is the number of people who can see it. So you've got to engage people in your vision. <laughs> Otherwise, it's an hallucination. The American Judges Association is the organization that Steve was the president of, I was the president of, and Tony was, is the president of. We have uh, a two-step plan for or at least trying to engage people in how to improve the justice system, and it is to improve procedural fairness and to improve better decision making. Uh, we have a 2007 procedural fairness white paper. If you don't have a copy of that, we'll get it for you. We did a 2010 thing on judicial elections, but our most recent thing, which was the three of us, is judicial decision making. What we're gonna talk about today is what the public thinks of us, thoughts on how we can make decisions and how we can become better at decision making, a quick tour through procedural fairness and how all this fits together. So we're gonna start with uh, a little bit of information about the public knowledge about the court system 
And he, Kevin mentioned we're going to do a quick tour of procedural fairness as well. We're doing quick things to set the stage for our discussion of mindfulness and mindful decision making because we work in a context. And the context we work in is the public's understanding of our justice system and their reactions to it. So let's take a quick look at what is the kind of depth of knowledge people bring with them to the courthouse and what is their view of our legitimacy? Um, as they get there, are they primed to think we're a legitimate agency, we're a legitimate entity, or are they primed to think we're of kind of questionable ilk? So, knowledge question, a basic question. Can the U.S. Supreme Court declare that a statute is unconstitutional? If the courts are supreme in deciding what the Constitution means and what the law means, the answer should be yes. But 45% of the American people either said they didn't know or said the Supreme Court cannot declare an act of Congress unconstitutional. Um, so while we have some knowledge out there, and we could show you a lot of different questions and answers, there's a lot of areas in which the public doesn't know some basic concepts about our system. They also bring some views about what the people within the system are motivated by. So this is a uh, Annenberg Public Policy Center question. To what extent do you think a judge's ruling is influenced by the judge's political views? And 75% uh, said to a great or moderate extent. But there's more than just political views that they think may be influencing a judge. When they ask them, to what extent do you think a judge's desire to be promoted to the next higher court would affect a judge's ability to be fair and impartial? Again, 75% said to a great extent or a moderate extent. Um, they're wondering what our motives are when they come into our building. Um, what is it we're really trying to achieve? Are we there for the same goal they are for, there for? Um, or are we there for something different? On the partisan front, the U.S. Supreme Court's uh, approval rating has remained pretty constant. But after Bush versus Gore, Republicans liked the court. After Obama was elected, suddenly Democrats liked the court, even though it was still a majority of Republican appointees. People have these lenses now in which they're looking at almost everything, and those lenses may also affect the way in which they look at us at their local courthouse. Confidence in public institutions generally is at the lowest point it's been recorded um, since we started having good, accurate public opinion polls. Um, this is a survey done in uh, June last year where we actually looked at state judges, the state court system in your state for each person question. Um, and you'll see that in terms of the deep purple, which is a great deal of confidence, only 12% have a great deal of confidence in state judges, only 13% a great deal of confidence in the state court system in their state. Um, you can add on uh, to get to 67% having at least some level of confidence in us, uh, but we've got a third of the people who have no confidence in us at all, and a very small group who are really very sold on us. This one is very interesting, again, in the Justice at Stake survey, targeting what people thought about the state courts in their own state. And do we provide good customer service to the people dealing with the courts? Only 12% said yes. And only another, uh, 30, uh, another 32 percent said we did that well. So 12 percent said we do that very well in customer service. Another 32 percent for a total of 44 percent saying we do it well, very well or well. So a majority of people don't think we provide good customer service. When people are asked what words describe the courts well, words like overwhelmed and inefficient got very high numbers uh, from people. So these are the attitudes they're coming to us with and we have to keep in mind. We also have to keep in mind we often don't look at the world the same way they do. Um, and this is one of judges. Um, the survey is a little dated, it's 2001, but I don't think the net result would be any different. Judges rated the courts in their own state. 96 percent of judges said the courts in their state were excellent or good. But only 8 percent of the public said the courts in their own state were excellent and 39% said they were just fair or poor. No judges said the courts in their state were poor, and only 4% of judges said the courts in their state were just fair. Um, I would suspect, well, I don't know. 
Maybe court staff would have a little better handle on that. But um, we're all one team, and we're all, I think, being evaluated together. Lawyers, to the extent you're law trained, how many of you are lawyers? Law degrees? Okay, you may have not catch the boat anymore either. Um, it turns out that law training kind of gets us off the point. Um, we start looking in our first year of law school at what's the outcome of each case, and we learn rules of law. And when people come to the courthouse, they're looking at, as we'll see in a moment, what are the procedures used to get to the result, not necessarily what the result is. So in a very good study in California, attorneys' overall approval of the California court system was very much driven by whether the court got the outcome right in each case. For the public, their overall appraisal of the court system was determined not by whether the outcomes were right, but by whether they thought people were treated by fair procedures when they went into the courthouse, were they listened to, and so forth. Um, so judges don't look at things the way the public does, and law-trained people generally don't look at things the way the public does. The good news is that we have room for improvement in our highest volume dockets. This was also from the California study. They looked at relative public approval by case type, and our highest volume dockets, traffic, family law, and small claims, had the lowest approval ratings from the public, the lowest satisfaction level with those courts. Um, so if we can convince people within our court system to do a better job in the high volume dockets in a variety of ways, um, we could pretty quickly make an improvement in the way people look at us overall. How many of you measure whether your cases are getting done timely? Like everybody, right? Okay. So backlog and all that other stuff. How many of you measure whether they're done fairly? Like nobody. Okay, now, Barbara Jordan once said, what the American people want is an America as good as its promise. I think that that's what they want of our courts. But I certainly part of that promise has to be that we're fair. And haven't we really reached the stage in which you say, I mean, it's like Drucker's thing, the management guy, what you measure is what you care about. So maybe we ought to just abandon the idea that we promise to be fair because we don't measure it, most of us. Now, there's some change in that. But I think in, in deference to your profession, part of the reason that you don't measure fairness is we don't agree on what the word means. And so we can't do it. So you can look at it this way. Outcome favorability, did I win? That's kind of what Steve talked about, the, about lawyers is. And you know, the bottom line is the promise of fairness, the promise of good courts, certainly is not about outcome favorability. You can't expect the Newark court to indicate 67% of the time plaintiffs win. What a good court. Okay, so that one doesn't work. But um, what the social science research says is that the litigants, the people who are coming in, in all those case types, actually they do want to win, but they know they might not. Okay. So we can't do that one. The second one is, did I get what I deserve? That'd be another way to look at fairness. And everybody who has been in a courtroom for any length of time has seen the experience where the judge sentences somebody to jail or prison and the defendant says, thank you, Your Honor. So in their own mind, they got what they deserved and they're okay with it. Uh, but I don't think it's possible for us to figure that one out. So the next question then is, was my case handled through fair procedures? And on that one, we can, indeed we must, begin to measure that. You need to come back to your court, talk to your judges, talk to the people in your courthouse, and say, if we're going to measure uh, timeliness of cases and case disposition, then surely we have to be open to the idea that we're going to measure whether we have fair procedures in our case. And there's good reason for it. 
Procedural fairness develops from research showing that how disputes are handled has an important influence on people's evaluation of their experience in the court system. So you look at all those negative numbers that Steve talked about and said, you know, if we have only 57% of the American people saying our courts are fair, put another way, 43% not saying it, that's a dangerous number. If you looked at that last number that he had, there is 39% of the American public describe us as intimidating. Those two, the combination of those two are pretty damning. And we've got to figure out a strategy to change that. Do any of you know who Tom Tyler is? Anybody? Tom Tyler te now teaches at Yale. He wrote a paper a number of years ago that I read. <clears throat> and it was about why do people obey judges' orders? Something I think all of us, whether you're a judge or an administrator, how do we get people to do what we want? Or put a different way, if you could convince your court when you go home that you have a strategy to get a 10% reduction in your caseload in the next 24 months, that'd be pretty dramatic, right? I mean, how many of you are going to get a 10% increase in your budget in the next 24 months? Just raise your hand. Like, none of you, right? Okay, so if you're not going to get 10% more money, then we've got to get 10% less work. If you could develop a strategy to convince your court, I have a way that I'm going to get better compliance with orders, it, you know, to 8, 10, 12% in a relatively short period of time, you dr dramatically reduce your workload. And out of all the numbers that you have, you get better. That's what this is about. Procedural fairness encourages decision acceptance and it leads to positive views about the legal system. So we got both things. We can change the public's attitude towards us or we can get better compliance. And if you think about it this way, as I spoke in Arkansas uh, last spring. Arkansas, anybody from Arkansas? Arkansas has about 2.9 million people and every year they get about 1.5 million filings. And everybody's a little concerned about all the bricks that are being thrown at the judiciary and politicalization and all that other stuff like that is. The way that we can move the American public is to view volume as our strength, not our weakness. All those people coming into the courthouse, if we could use, view them as a way to change the public's attitude towards courts, we make a huge difference. You think about your state, you think about you, where you are in the community and you see all those cases and you say, you know, this is an opportunity to do serious change away pe the way people look view our system. Now, if you think that Steve and I and Pam are full of it, there's actually a study uh, from the UCLA uh, Institute of Neuroscience and Human Behavior that says uh, perceived fairness triggers brain reactions similar to eating chocolate or seeing a pretty face. So if you don't want to join us in the adventure to make court systems fairer, the least you can do is put chocolate kisses at the courthouse for people coming in or leaving. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to take you through 30 years of social science research in about a minute and a half, okay? Tyler and Lind begin actually in the 80s and they say Respectful and dignified treatment of disputants is the key to litigant satisfaction. We got to be, you know, we got to have a better feel. Now it's tough for us. I got, you know, there's lots of reasons that people are stressed out. Do any of you um, shop at or have ever, ever been at Neiman Marcus? Okay. If you go to Neiman Marcus, I'll bet you uh, that if you stand looking lost there within five minutes or something, somebody comes up and says, may I help you? Too many of the state courts, if you stand looking lost, the, the guard will kick you out at the end of the day. And so we gotta figure out how to get a Neiman-like feel in our courthouses. Greenberg, uh, in his school of thought, says providing explanations is really important. So you have people who come into the court, they don't even know something as basic as could the United States Supreme Court declare an act unconstitutional. So they don't know as much as we do. We take a lot of things for granted and something happens to them and they don't have any context for it. 
So we got to figure out a way to make sure, this is Greenberg's theory, is we got to get better at explanations. Most of what we do is so outcome oriented, we did the right thing, what more do you want? And actually, you want more, you want an explanation. Think of your own life. When you go to a doctor today, doctors are a lot better at trying to explain what's wrong with you, why we're doing this, and then they get better compliance with taking medication and all kinds of other stuff. So that was Greenberg. Greenberg actually comes and says, treating decision recipients respectfully is really pretty important. Tyler and Lynn's group, these are not just them, but they're kind of thinking, says trustworthy authority is really important. And that's why Steve explained to you, we're at an era in which we're not a trustworthy authority. People are thinking that we make decisions because we want to be on the Court of Appeals, we want to be some, we're just a political branch of government. We, so we've got to figure out how to weigh trustworthy authority. Because we have a lot of people who don't trust us. You look at all those numbers, they're crushingly bad. Tyler and Lynn says belief in unbiased decision making is really important. So then you end up with uh, large numbers of people in the African American community are coming into our court. They have very negative attitudes towards the police. And then we've got to change that. We're not going to change their attitude towards the police. That's their problem. But we've got to end up figuring out a way to get belief in unbiased decision making. And uh, all of this ends up with this bottom line. If you can move a sense of procedural fairness in your courthouse, you can get higher compliance with orders. You're not going to get sociopaths to obey orders. I'm not talking about that. I'm not being naive about you're going to get everybody. But if you could get 8, 10, 12% in a relatively short period of time, you make a big difference. And it can be something as simple as this. A certain number of people show up on the wrong day at the wrong time. That's totally unacceptable. We've got to figure out to end up to say is obey, uh, compliance with orders is really important. Take the Achilles heel that Steve mentioned, which is family law. You don't want post-decree stuff. I want to get rid of that business. So the explanation of why we're doing this is as important as the outcome. The explanation actually might be more important to litigants than the actual result. I'm not saying nobody likes to lose. But the bottom line is the research says this works. So finish up procedural fairness. Um, the research shows this is stuff actually that doesn't fade away for people. So if they feel they were treated fairly when they come to court, their perception of that will remain with them uh, and continue to uh, influence their view of the court system for even decades. And it works across ethnic, racial, and income and education level groups. All of them seem to be affected by this information. So what are we talking about? Four elements, procedural fairness, voice, neutrality, respect, and trust. And we'll give a real quick breakdown of what we mean by that. For voice, people really want an opportunity to tell things in their own terms, and preferably tell it themselves. Um, even grade school kids want to be listened to before mom decides their punishment um, for the, the infraction. Um, there's plenty of times at which people simply want to be heard. Neutrality, they need to have an understandable explanation of why things are happening to them, what the procedures are, and what the rulings are, and preferably with some specific um, neutral authority, such as a statute or a court rule that you can pull down and say, here it is, this is why we're doing what we're doing. Respect is something that starts at the front door of the courthouse and certainly doesn't end until they leave the courthouse. Um, they're dealing with a lot of different people as they come through our system. Are people giving them information of, about what their rights are? Are they told how they can complain to a higher authority uh, if they have some complaint about the way they're treated in their venture to the court system? Judges need to explain why some of the things they may care about aren't able to be accommodated that day in the court system. Um, but that shows a respect for their concerns even if you can't accommodate it. They're coming to court as citizens addressing a branch of government 
They view that as their right as we get more and more self-represented people and people have a view that they should be able to personally access their court system without the need for a lawyer. Um, explaining to them what their rights are is something we have to spend a lot more time doing. We are spending a lot more time doing it, but sometimes we simply get a little frustrated in the process. Um, trust is one of these things that somewhat comes by doing all the others. Um, if we let people have voice, if we treat them with respect, if they're clear that they have been dealt with and the rulings were based on neutral authorities, they will end up trusting the people they're dealing with but it also has a sort of its extra dimension, which is they need to feel the people they're coming in contact are sincere and caring. So if they feel you're sincere and care about them, and you do all the other things, you will score very well on procedural fairness, and you will then score well in their overall impression of the justice system. Um, well, a number of years ago, the National Center for State Courts did a study <clears throat> of public trust and confidence in the courts. And one of the things that came out was 40% of the American public believe that judges' orders are not understandable. Now, I don't think we're that bad, but what if we are? What if large numbers of people are leaving our court and they don't understand what happened? How many of you would be satisfied if 99.9% .9 of the people leaving your court understood the orders and why they were issued. Just raise your hand. Okay. Now here's the deal. How many of you are going to be flying home? Most of you are going to fly home, right? A lot of you? Okay. If you fly through Chicago and they get it 99.9% .9 right, there will be two crashes today. 99.9% for air traffic controllers mean if you're going through Atlanta or you're going through Chicago, two planes are going down today. Okay. So that's not acceptable to a large number of people. But I get the idea of saying, uh, you know, we've got a little different thing than air traffic controller. So in our court, we measured it once. But well, we actually measured it a bunch of times. I'll tell you one study. We interviewed defendants in domestic abuse cases five minutes after the bail or sentencing decision to determine whether or not they understood the orders. We had the same skepticism that you did. Uh, we have uh, a large Somali population in Minnesota, so you, or Minneapolis, so you'd have language and cultural issues that would interfere. We have presumably the same number of sociopaths as you have in your court. We have a very strange group of people who come into the Minneapolis courts. They're called cheeseheads. They're Packer fans. They clearly would not understand what's going on. Okay? Now here's what happened. Several judges actually got 100%. Some got 90, few got 80, and one judge who had a really great reputation on the bench, 40% of the defendants within five minutes didn't understand what was going on. That's why you have to go back and say, in our court, we begin to measure something that's as fundamental as fairness. If people are leaving your court not understanding what's going on, it's a disaster. Now, here's some ideas you could, oops. Most of you in the room know about court tools. So you could go to court tools number one and say, I don't know about all the rest of them, but here's some things that we could use to measure we can end up cobbling together some stuff and say it's not perfect, but there are mechanisms out there to begin to measure procedural fairness. And if we are committed to fairness in our court, we've got to figure out a way to do it. So there's court tools. So why should court leaders care? You're not going to significantly get more resources any time. Enhanced procedural fairness has been shown to increase compliance with court orders. It reduces caseload. You've got to figure out a strategy to end up saying, I'm going to figure out a way to get better compliance with our orders. We compete with education, health care, and lots of other things for uh, money. So the idea of running up and saying, oh, we're a separate branch of government, give us a bunch of money, like that has not worked very well. So we're going to sum up. This stuff works with the public. We aren't naturally attuned to the way court participation view us. We face a time of budgetary limits. 
and we need to figure out how to perform, to perform and reach those perceptions. So now we've got to become a little bit more mindful in our better decisions. Okay, now, we're, this is, you've got to follow this very carefully. I want you to watch the video carefully, and then I'm going to ask you how you did. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half miss the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla experiment at theinvisiblegorilla.com. So, good morning. So, one of the things that the uh, monkey business illusion demonstrates is that um, what psychologists refer to as inattentional blindness. The idea that if you're attending to one thing, then you're going to miss something else. And the important piece to take away from it is, attention is a limited resource. We are bombarded all day long with sensory information. If you think about yourself sitting in this room right now, you're taking in the light of the room, the audio, there's background noise from the room next door to us, um, your body is regulating itself to temperature. So there's all of this sensory information that is constantly hitting us. And yet what you're doing, for the most part, is paying attention to me, paying attention to us, listening to us, focusing on it, maybe maybe reading the screen. So the question is, how do we do that? How do we have all of this other information coming in, but then step back and focus on certain things? And psychologists, cognitive psychologists, social psychologists have been studying that question for many years, decades. And recently, neuroscientists have joined. And they've got some pretty intriguing insights into how our brain starts to process information. They, for the most part, divide it up into two different kinds of modes of processing. One is we refer to as reflexive. If you think of a reflex, if you think of walking into bright sunlight after coming out of a movie theater, you don't, you don't try, you don't think about it, your body just blinks. And a lot of what we do is reflexive. It's fast, it's automatic, it's pretty much unconscious, and it's pretty much always on. The other mode is a much more deliberative mode. It's slow, it's conscious. You know, if I say to you, you have to solve this math problem, you're gonna have to sit down and really focus your attention on it. This reflective side is much more limited in capacity. So let's go back to reflexive here and just talk about how it all works. The way our brains 
um, come to be able to do things so automatically is if you think about a baby coming into the world, there's all of this information that a, that a baby takes in and you have to start to sort and categorize it and figure out what goes with what. And over time, the way we experience our world, we develop our patterns, we develop schemas. So you can have a schema for objects, a schema for directions, a schema for activities, driving a car. Think about the first time you tried to drive a car. You kind of, you got into the seat and you, you put your key in the ignition and you're trying to figure out what, you know, is this the gas pedal or the brake pedal? It was a very kind of deliberative, reflective process. But over time, you just jump in the car now and turn it on. You don't really think about it. You don't say, what do I need to do here? If you look at this couple who's just married, I don't think they're really thinking about how do we make this car go. Um, they're trying to figure out their next step in life. Um, and we also have schemas. We also develop schemas about people as well. So if you take a look at this picture down here, what, what's your sense? What is this a picture of? A retired lady, an elderly lady, an older lady. She's got gray hair, wrinkles, you know, we, that's kind of our schema for what an older person looks like. Um, and these, because we have these schemas, we can get through the day pretty, pretty quickly. You know, we don't get up in the morning and say, how do I take a shower? You take a shower. You don't, you don't say, how do I brush my teeth? You brush your teeth. It just allows us to get through the day. Um, most of what we do, most of the time, we rely on this default reflexive processing. That's how we get through the day. And the good news is, sometimes reflexive processing is great. It helps us. Um, there are times when relying on our intuition, on, on the lessons and schemas that we have learned over time are, is actually better for us. Uh, there's a, a, a study about firefighters who have been firefighters for a very long time. They go into a house, they, they sense something's wrong, they get out of the house, the house goes down, they're asked, how did you know that? And they just know it from their years of experience of taking in all of the different kinds of characteristics about a fire. In that case, you don't want the firefighter going into the house and saying, let me think through here, what are the five criteria for, the, for, for a fire? You just want them to react. So there are lots of times when our reflexive system is a very good, reliable way to process information. The downside is sometimes our schemas can be inaccurate. Sometimes we have associated characteristics with certain objects or certain people or certain activities, and they're not altogether um, accurate all the time. So we might have superstitions when things are related that really aren't related. They're not really cause and effect. They just happened at the same time. Or we might be using some stereotypes. So there are some characteristics that are true at some points for some people, but they're really not true all, along, all, the, all the time. And then there are times when we might use a schema in one place and it's inappropriate in another place. So there are times when we need to be checking. We need to be using our reflective system to kind of check on some of these schemas that we're just going through life and using. Two, I will just mention um, two areas where we can kind of get in trouble with our relying just on our reflexive system are cognitive heuristics, and I think that's a, one of these terms that psychologists use, but it's really, um, you've, you've heard it a lot in terms of um, uh, the glass being half full or the glass being half empty, you know, how, what's your frame of reference? And, and if you take one frame of reference, you're going to go down one road. If you take another frame of reference, you're going to go down another road. A heuristic is basically a shorthand. It's a rule of thumb that people, you, people use to make decisions. But what you do is you wind up leaving out information. You're not looking at all of the positives and the negatives, you're either looking at the glass half empty or you're looking at the glass half full. Other examples are anchoring, you know, you put out a value and then even if the value is a random value, you might use it to, it's, in the, it's been primed in your head, so you might be using it to estimate things higher or lower based on that 
random value. Um, hindsight, Monday morning quarterbacking. You know, it's always, it always seems so much easier after you know the answer. Um, and egocentric is um, we are incredibly confident about um, our answers. So we tend to just say, you know, of course I could do that, or of course that's the right answer. Um, another set of um, areas, or another, another area where we can be um, uh, concerned about using just our reflexive processes is implicit biases. Implicit biases are based on implicit stereotypes and attitudes that we have that operate below the radar. So we don't, we don't actually, we're not conscious of them. And research has shown that even people who strive very hard to be objective and fair um, don't, can also be um, influenced by implicit biases. So I'm going to let the judge talk about how judges react to heuristics. So this is just one example. I mean, and you know this from working with your judges. Judges think that they've got some special training and they, they're oblivious to this kind of stuff, right? right. So here's a, one example. It was done uh, by a trio of researchers, but what basically what happened was they gave about 200 judges a simple fact situation. It's an egregious sexual assault, sexual harassment in the workplace case. Uh, half of them are told that uh, the defendant moved to dismiss for lack of federal diversity jurisdiction, meaning there's less than $75,000 in, in damages. And then the judges were asked, what would you award in this case? Okay. Now, if you think about this dispassionately, that second thing, which is half the judges were told about this, makes no difference, right? Because the judges were simply to ask, what are you supposed to do? The judges who were told of the motion awarded $882,000. The judges who were not, the average was $1.2 million. That's a big range. And that challenges the question, it seems to me, as to whether judges' training is really going to be effective in dealing with becoming better decision makers. But you're not judges. So there's the question. How about your decisions? Since we know about faulty decision making by judges, in fact, all of you in the room know a lot about it, uh, what about your decisions? How about your staff? Are we as court leaders at a point where there is an imperative that judges, court administration, and staff all need to become better decision makers? Don't you really need to go back to your court and say, we need to become better decision makers. So a little bit more about implicit bias. Um, the idea, uh, psychologists measure implicit bias in many different ways, but the most common way of measuring it is through um, reaction time. And so the idea is that because of our schemas, if you remember the old lady in the picture, because of our schemas, we associate certain characteristics with certain objects or people much faster than we do with others. So we have a tendency, for example, to associate elderly and frail much faster than we would elderly and robust. And so over time, we have developed um, numerous uh, tests of implicit bias that measure reaction time. Project Implicit is a um, uh, project that the uh, psychologists from Harvard, the University of Washington, and um, the University of Virginia developed. There's a web website called Project Implicit, and it has over 15 of these implicit bias tests. They're very short. You go on a computer and you can take the test yourself. Um, what they found was um, looking at data from, I think, 2000 to 2006, they looked at something like two and a half million um, people who have taken these tests over the, that period of time, is that overwhelmingly people associate or, or have stronger preferences for the socially dominant group. So, for instance, whites over black, 
um, straight over gay. So there's all of this information that's just carried around because of our associations and our schemas that are impacting how we, that are influencing our behaviors and decisions. So Raklinski and his colleagues took a look at judges and tried to figure out, well, does that, does that affect judges? I mean, if you think about it, judges are trained to be fair and honest, and so they might rise above that. However, they found that even with the judges, there was a strong preference for whites. Um, the black judges were pretty much even. Um, there, was, there was no strong preference one way or another. Um, and, and they also found that there was some um, evidence that, they were inf that the um, biases were influencing their decisions. The key finding, though, that I think, and that what's really important for us here, is they said, when judges are aware of a need to monitor their own responses for the influence of implicit racial biases and are motivated to suppress that bias, they are able to, to do so. And again, it's the idea of bringing in our reflective system, bringing in our attention to it, and not just going on automatic. So implicit bias can and does occur, um, but the uh, more all of us know about implicit bias and understand our tendencies, the more likely we can make decisions. Um, and as I said earlier, you can go to Project Implicit if you'd like to take one of these tests yourself and just see how it actually works in practice. It um, will give you some additional information. Let's see. Oh, okay. So this is fun. This is a, just a little test. Um, what I want you to do is read this, read this. Name the color of each word that you see as it appears. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a screen. I just want you to name the color. How many people have, know what this is, the Stroop test? Okay, so just name, yeah, name the color out loud, all of us together. All right, you ready? Go. Whoa. <laughs> so, did, now, now, were you attending to that? Did you get that? Come on, come on. All right, how was that? Okay. Now, I want you to once again name the color of each word that you see as it appears. Okay, name the color. Ready? <laughs> Very good. You guys were actually pretty good. I, I, I've done this before and it's all over the place. Um, so, I'm interested for the, the uh, lady here who's, who did it before, Does, did you still trip up on it a little bit? Every time you do it, you still keep tripping up. And so even though you know it's coming, you, it's still hard because it's that reflexive system. We are so tuned into reading a word rather than looking at the color that even when we, when we um, yes? You know, that would be a good, um, good study to do. What I would say is there's a lot of research on how, um, particularly those of us who live in countries where we, we read things so much, we are so keyed to reading whenever we see words. In fact, there are studies that will just give um, kind of the beginnings of words and the end, the beginning letters of words in the end, and, and put nonsense letters in the middle, but we're still able to read it because we're so used to reading f from one direction to the other and making sense out of what it is. So my sense is it would still work, but we could try it to make sure sometime. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. 
So I think basically what, to, what you take away from this is, again, sometimes you have to constantly, in, you have to consciously engage your reflective system in order to override your reflexive, your reflective system in order to override your reflexive one. It's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the, um, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> you need five. Oh, five, yeah, okay. So five. commerce, education, and uh, the... Um, uh, uh, EPA? EPA, there you go. No, I can't. Right, let's stop, let's stop deposition. Seriously? Um, Is EPA no. the one you were talking about? Or? No, sir. No, sir, we were talking about the... Um, agencies of government. EPA needs to be rebuilt. But There's you no can't, doubt about that. But you that. can't name the third one. The third agency of government. Yeah. I would. I would do away with the education, uh, the uh, <laughs> commerce. I, I, commerce, and let's see. I can't. The third one. I can't. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. Oops. <laughs> um. After the election, um, they came out with a book trying to give his viewpoint of what was going on. And what they said was that he had been suffering a sleep disorder for many days before this presidential debate and had not been able to sleep for something like 72 hours. Um, and can Rick Perry memorize three cabinet agencies he intends to eliminate? Sure he can. Has he given that speech all the time on the stump? Yes, he had. But without sleep, he was just lost that night. Um, so fatigue is one of those things that can cause any of us to have great difficulty. And yet, when we're doing really important work that involves the public trust and involves people's lives, we don't think about it as anything as a knock. I know lots of judges that if you're out late, you're not really thinking about the effect that might have on your performance. Um, they've shown now that when sleep is reduced to six or fewer hours over a 14-day period, that can cause problems equal to those caused by two full nights of sleep deprivation. Um, as my colleagues know, I'm testing that out myself because I'm almost two weeks into having great difficulty getting to sleep. and I, I bet I'm pretty close right now to the six hours for 14 days. This isn't, isn't good. Um, so I'm going to move on from that slide because it's scaring me. Depleted resources is an issue. Um, your glucose level needs to be sufficient to support brain activity. Um, it is a drain on our system to be engaging in reflective thinking. And um, as we've said before, our ability to process information is a limited resource. So we can't be all the time 100% attentive. 100% reflective, we just can't manage it. Um, on the other hand, if we are having a difficulty of maintaining our glucose level, that will cause us to lose self-control, lose attention, and be unable to deal with stress. Um, so maintaining um, good energy levels throughout the day by proper diet is also simply important to making good decisions. So do you know when the best time to appear before a judge is? Anybody? What's the best, best time to appear before a judge? First thing, first thing. Right after breakfast, right after lunch. And actually there's a study to show that. There's a study that was done of uh, 1,500 decisions by, made, by Israeli judges, but there's no reason to believe that it wouldn't be applicable here. And what it showed was as the morning goes by, you get compassion fatigue. And then you get a break and then you get com uh, come back and you go in the afternoon and you get compassion fatigue. It's a very valid study, I can sh share it with you. But I think these are the things that I would come away from it is. Many of you in this room design calendars, okay? So then you gotta end up saying, well, look, does the design of our calendaring system affect decision making in the courtroom? And the same is true of your own decision making. When's the best time to go in and see the uh, court administrator? Right after breakfast or right after lunch? Your decision making 
uh, changes in the morning. Your decision making changes in the afternoon. And so it's not that you can make anything perfect, but when you add all of these things together, what we do is pretty complex. And if nothing else is, are we setting the judges up for compassion fatigue? Am I setting myself up for the same kind of stuff? So mood. So mood is kind of an interesting thing in terms of the research that we've done on it. Um, you tend to think that if you're really upbeat and in a great mood that you're going to be very positive and, and um, really focused on what you're doing. And what we found is that um, being in a really good positive mood can be very helpful if you're doing very creative work or if you're trying to be um, um, very expansive in your thinking. It's not particularly great for doing very detailed, um, complex work. Basically, when we're in a really good mood, we're kind of, we like the status quo. Um, we kind of rely on our reflexive system a little bit more because everything's going along fine. We don't necessarily want to change that. Um, but if we're in kind of a negative mood, then we have, it's, it's like we know something's not quite right, so our reflective brain is already engaged. So we have a tendency to be a little bit more focused when we're in somewhat of a negative mood. Now, this doesn't mean that if you're going to go do um, very difficult kinds of complex work, you know, work on your budget, that you have to put yourself into a bad mood to do it. But again, it's going back to the whole idea of being vigilant, understanding where you are, just kind of taking in what you're processing, what you're focusing on, um, just to help you make sure that you're not missing something um, because you're just relying on that reflexive system too much. Um, fluency. Fluency is another one of these words that psychologists use, but basically it's just the ease of processing information. And if you think of advertisers, advertisers rely on fluency all the time. They're trying to pair um, their product with a simple jingle or a simple um, slogan. And you hear it over and over and over, and so then it becomes fluent to you. It, it's it's um, reflexive. You find, it, you find it easy to bring that information to bear. So you go down the cereal aisle, and all of a sudden you see the cereal that you always are hearing about on TV, and you buy the, you buy the cereal. <clears throat> when when information is presented to us in a very fluent way, we tend to think of it as more trustworthy, as, as um, we have more confidence in that information. Um, but actually, when the disfluent, when something is disfluent, when it's hard to understand, then again, we're engaging our reflexive system. So for instance, they've done, I mean reflective system, thank you. We, um, they've done a, a, a test, there's a, a a test called the cognitive reflection test. And it's basically three questions. And they're little math questions. But they have very intuitive answers. You're, you have a knee-jerk response to do it, the intuitive answer. But the intuitive answer is not correct. It's actually much harder than it looks. The, the question is much harder than it looks. And you actually need to spend a little bit of time trying to figure out what the answer is. And what they did is they gave those three questions to people um, straight out, and then they gave those same three questions to another group, and they put it in really hard to read font. And the people who had the disfluent um, set of questions were able to get those answers correct more than the people who just had the easy to, easy to read set of questions. So again, the idea was that because we had this um, this idea, this reflect, our reflective system kicked in because we saw that there was a problem there. We had to focus on it much more than we would have if it was just easy to read. Multitasking has a price. 97% of people, it affects performance. Um, and the bottom line is, I don't think we in the court community 
have really come to grips with, we built it in. We invited people to multitask and we've got to begin to look at it. So let me give you this example. All of you in this room, because of all those tech people are, let's get some computers in the courtroom. We've got new stuff. We've got e-filing. We've got all kinds of stuff here and things like that. If you had been uh, checking out your stuff on your computer, how many of you think you could have got 16 passes in the monkey business thing? Yeah, probably none of you, right? Now, here is a, a, a picture of a trial from Norway. The trial is the defendant killed the 70 kids, you know, the horrible thing where he shot all those people. See where it's circled there? That's the judge. That's his computer. Are any of you public information people for deal with the press? Okay, you're going to be my prop. At the end of the day, the guy up there is testifying about the sanity of the defendant. The news media comes to you at the end of the day and says, in this picture, in this circle part, the judge was playing solitaire during the testimony. Sir, what do you have to answer for the court system? <laughs> yep, well, okay. <laughs> Here's the point. Thank you. <laughs> Worked very good. All right. What actually the guy did say was that was an unauthorized photograph. That didn't work. Okay. Um, the people in Norway that saw this photograph, in all seriousness, have serious questions then about the legitimacy of decision making. But why wouldn't you think the same thing is true in your court? Because remember, they don't trust you in the first place. And does this technology, I'm not knocking it, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but don't you need to talk about the dangers of multitasking when we put these things in there? Because when you get bored, you go on the computer there. You check your stuff out. And we don't know whether you're playing solitaire or not. So in our, in our paper, we have uh, a number of what we think are useful suggestions for becoming more mindful in our daily work. Um, one of them is to focus on the purpose. Why are we there? Um, we're there to provide a justice system to people that meets their needs. Um, and uh, focusing on purpose can help us bring things to our reflective mind more frequently uh, as an overall goal. Do any of you feel stressed from time to time doing your daily work? Okay. Do you think you're as stressed as, say, a Marine preparing for deployment in counterinsurgency duty in Iraq and Afghanistan? Anybody who thinks your daily work is more stressful than those Marines? Okay. Um, I want to show you a very quick video clip. No, I, I'll get it, but we'll still show the clip. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a professor at the University of Miami named Amishi Jha. And she's got some great stuff going uh, and actually is getting millions of dollars of government money from the military to do further training of our military personnel in mindfulness. Um, and the purpose of the, the training is to keep their mental capacity in deployment from being depleted. Um, so what they did was take Marines who were specifically getting ready for deployment in counterinsurgency work and give them this training although some of them didn't get it, and so they were able to compare the results of the two groups. So um, we wanted to see if we might be able to improve working memory capacity in people that the stage was set that they're going to be de depleted in their capacity. It's a high stress situation. Um, they're using their working memory for a long period of time because they're preparing for a big task ahead. In this case, it was Marines that were preparing for deployment. And if they're depleted in their capacity, they're more likely to make impulsive choices that could further add to the problem, that could add to the stress, that could add to the uh, anxiety. So that was the question. Can we improve working memory capacity? And the thing that really struck us was that when we looked at people, Marines, that didn't get any training at all, and we just tested them twice within a two-month interval, 
um, around six or seven months before they were deployed. So, you know, eight months before and then six months before they were deployed. In that two month interval, we saw that their working memory capacity was actually declining. Declining to the level that we'd almost say is putting them at, at risk for this kind of impulsive behavior. So we wanted to see, could we reduce the rate of decline if we offered them mindfulness training? And what we found was that actually we could. So the Marines that received a specific form of mindfulness training called mindfulness-based mind fitness training that was developed by my colleague Elizabeth Stan Stanley at Georgetown um, allowed mindfulness to be introduced in a way that perfectly worked with the Marine mindset. They were trained in techniques that would help them with their actual job. And those participants that practiced the exercises she gave them for as little as 12 minutes a day actually kept their working memory stable. They didn't degrade. If they practiced more than that, they actually got better. Whereas people that didn't practice at all or practiced very little declined. So a few um, more uh, quick, quick more ideas here. Um, one of the things we've been saying is read your dials. You know, do you need to take a break? Do you need to go get a snack? Do you get your, your glucose levels up? If you're really kind of tired and slumping, then be mindful about it and do something about it. Um, meditation practices. The, the whole idea about mindfulness, it tends to be this kind of um, otherworldly thing. People talk about it. It's meditation, but it's meditation that um, a number of major organizations, in, you know, from the Marines to medicine to um, places like Aetna and General Mills, they are now um, providing mindfulness training as part of their employee development. So it's not quite as crazy as it may sound. Um, a really quick kind of thing you can do is, um, it's called the stop meditation. And it's, you know, when you feel yourself getting bored or getting overwhelmed or getting angry, you can just actually take a moment where you stop whatever you're doing, you take a deep breath, and you can do it fairly incon um, inconspicuously. And you observe what you're feeling. I mean, you really take in, what is my body doing? What am I doing? How am I feeling? And then you proceed, and you proceed with a new awareness. And you might go ahead and react just the same way you were going to react, but you also might say, you know, I'm just going to let that one go for right now. Um, Justice Breyer um, has said that every, every day he takes a few minutes, you know, I believe in the morning and at lunchtime, and he just kind of sits quietly. So he has been basically meditating for many years now, and he has found that to be a helpful um, technique. Um, for for uh, court managers, one of the things is to, one of the ways to be mindful, one of the ways to bring your reflective brain back in is to um, try to seek feedback, um, ask, ask others to help you, um, seek mentors. Uh, one of the famous doctors uh, improved his um, his work by having a, another doctor follow him around and just identify little things that he was doing that could improve how he was um, handling his surgeries. Um, it's amazing what somebody else watching you, what kind of information they can provide. Um, accountability, checklists, um, pilots, um, doctors, again, use checklists. Those are all good techniques for helping to be more mindful. And again, simply asking yourself why as you go through the day, why am I doing this, um, forces that reflective side to come back in. Procedural fairness, in a nutshell, really comes down to was a person listened to, were people treated with respect, and do they understand what happened? Um, do they understand what the decision was, and was it made for neutral principles? Um, this can be turned into a PR thing for a court system. And the state of Alaska is now, anybody here from Alaska? Okay, I didn't think so, but the state of Alaska has now put a pledge of fairness in all 44 courthouses in Alaska. And it's uh, translated into six languages in addition to English. Um, Kevin Burke had been trying, actually, he, he's going around all the, over the country speaking about procedural fairness. And he's had um, chief justices in multiple states invite him in to do specific things. He's been trying for 
actually two years, to get a state to adopt a fairness pledge, and Alaska took him up on it. And um, the Chief Justice announced this in their State of the Judiciary message in January, and it's now posted in every, Nebraska, every Alaska courthouse. Um, so um, it says at the bottom, we will listen to you, we will respond to your questions about court procedure, and we will treat you with respect. Um, for more information on this, we've got a procedural fairness website, proceduralfairness.org. It also has a blog associated with us you can get to from that page, proceduralfairness.org, um, for more information. So procedural fairness is really more than just about appearances. It really is about voice. And the bottom line is this, because you're the court leaders is, it's not going to work in your courthouse if you don't practice this as a management philosophy too. I mean, it's really important if you're going to expect people at the counter to be nice and respectful and give people voice, and make sure they understand decisions, then that's the way you've got to operate yourself in terms of how you run the courthouse. It's got to be a feel for the entire courthouse. <clears throat> now, here's some ways to follow up. We have uh, an AJA blog. We've got the procedural fairness blog. We've got two issues of court review. If you want to uh, share uh, the papers that Pam, Steve, and I wrote with the judges and staff, uh, the paper on procedural fairness that Steve and I wrote, they're available there. There's a lot of courts, there's a lot of people who are out there who are trying to do this. So my plea to you actually is, on the way home, make a plan. The plan is I'm going to engage my judges and my staff in meeting Barbara Jordan's uh, thing. I want to have a courthouse as good as our promise. And we're going to get better at doing the issues of fairness. We're going to begin to commit to measuring it and holding ourselves accountable for it and getting some feedback. To be a court leader, all you need is commitment. And so very good. Now go out there and convince others. Uh, thank you very much for having Steve, Pam, and I meet with you. If you'd like the slides, Pam Casey's uh, email is up there. Uh, or you can go to our website on procedural fairness, and you can find out how to get hold of us. Thanks very much for having us.